cannot invent and pioneer if you cannot accept failure. We wanted people that were insanely great at what they did. Nobody was making any money at all. Uh, most people thought the internet was going to be a fad. All right. Today on the podcast, I'm bringing Jonathan on, and we are going to talk about some half-baked startup ideas and companies that have gotten our attention. Where we're kind of testing this new segment where for anyone out there that's like, hey, I want to start something or I want to do something innovative at my company, um, we want to put fuel on that fire and hopefully overwhelm me with some ideas and things that got our attention. Um, but but we'll we'll see how it goes. But Jonathan, I'm looking at this Google Doc. There's there's some good stuff here. Yeah, I'm excited to try this new concept. Um, these are pretty much the same things that resonate with me that I look out for when it's on newsletters or YouTube videos or whatever. So we'll see if the uh, the audience uh, likes it as well. Nice. By the way, I um, you're talking to me after I just got big timed by like a 20 something with not that size matters, but it's a company that's smaller than ours. He sent me an email with his executive assistant. I'll be like, hey, like, love what you're doing. Would love to talk to see if we could do like a, a collaboration or something. So I'm like, okay, sure. You know, he's, he does it. kind of an interesting company. So I get on the Zoom and it's just me and his executive assistant, and which is fine. But I'm, I'm like waiting for him. We'll call him Brad. She's like, yeah. Um, she's like, Brad's not going to be here. He wanted me to talk to you to make sure like that, you know, the, you're a right fit essentially. And so I'm like, Wow. Like he literally invited me to do a, a call, ghosted me, had his EA vet me to see if I'm I'm worthy. Like part of me was initially very insulted. Like, how dare, how dare he? And then I got to think about it. I was like, you know what? I kind of respect the hustle as far as how productive and efficient he was, but I found myself selling myself and my services to someone in the Philippines that could probably care less around um, what we do and whatnot. But anyway, um, I don't know if my ego should be bruised or not, but I, I feel like I just got big timed. Well, that was a strong power play by, by Brad, let's call him. <laughs> <laughs> and something tells me that the person who did the initial outreach might also be the executive assistant. Um, <laughs> should maybe give an instructions to look for a growth marketer that looks competent and reach out to them and like, you know, make it sound clever. Um, and you felt compelled, like you're going to talk to some big shot, but uh, that's, that's funny because I know we've been on a few calls where with clients, for example, where they have, uh, you know, they have their power plays or ego plays, whatever you're going to call it. Um, but yeah, I hope something good comes out of it though. That's the yeah. most important thing. Well, I'm going to one up him on the next follow-up call. I'm going to have a virtual assistant sub in for me, you know, because I have yeah. to get the last laugh. But, you know, it's, you know, don't yeah. hate the player, hate the game. So I, I respect that. But, um, dude, before we get into the ideas, I want to talk about some of the things that I'm like reading or attempting to read um, that I'm I'm super into. First is buy back your time by Dan Martell. Um, so Dan, he has like the SaaS Academy. I think he's sold multiple companies and the concept isn't necessarily new, but the way he positions is really interesting where he talks about whenever you have a company, you're usually hiring to grow. And it's like, oh, I need a creative director now. I need an ops person. And he is kind of saying that's the wrong way to hire you need to hire based on your calendar. If you look at your calendar, where do you spend most of your time where that's not your like your your essence of where you're really strong and hire for that. So it could be like for me, get a salesperson, you know, get someone to help with fulfillment, someone that does contracts because if you're the founder, the executive, you can have the biggest impact on the company and you need to hire to buy back your time to focus on those high impact things or to have the lifestyle you want. And it's very like framework and tactics heavy, which I'm, I'm a sucker for frameworks, but it's um, it's pretty eye opening. It's, it's, it's very much derived from the four hour work week and you know, hiring VAs and people to help you, but it's it's with a different lens. But anyway, that that one's pretty interesting right now. Sounds like Brad from earlier <laughs> this book, <laughs> that virtual assistant. Uh, yeah, I, that's I think he got the early edition before I did, probably. <laughs> yeah, um, actually, the first book that I will, you know, that I'm, I, I guess I'll recommend is one that I haven't even started. I think you recommended, Jim. It's the Seven Powers book. 
Mm -hmm. um, apparently, like a Bible in Silicon Valley, and a lot of you know big shot executives read it. And I read the synopsis several times, and I know it's probably going to be the best book I'll read this entire year. The content is is remarkable. There are angles in there that. Like I've heard from different thinkers, but I don't think anyone has ever put it in, in one book. So I'm, that's like the book that I'm waiting for. I'm going to like sit down with it with highlighter in hand. I'm not going to do this over an audiobook or something like that. So it's, it's that important. Uh, but yeah, that's that's one that I'm looking forward to. Uh, but yeah. I'll yeah, I, I like that you plug a book you, you haven't read yet. But no, I, I do agree. That's one where you're like, you don't want to read it lightly. You need to have your thinking cap on because it, it goes pretty deep, but it's super impactful. And the acquired yeah. podcast, which I'm a huge fan of um, at the end of their episodes, they always look at the seven powers and why a business thrived based on which power law they, they leverage, which is pretty cool. Um, okay. The last one that I'm, so I'm, I'm kind of reading two books. I like go back and forth when I say read their audio books. So it's all a lie. I'm listening to someone read a book to me. Um, it's amp it up, which it's, it's one of those things like you think you're working hard and you're going at this fast pace. And then I started to read Amp It Up and I was like, oh man, I am just a complete amateur with this. And this is from uh, Frank Slootman. He is the CEO of Snowflake, but he has taken three companies um, to over a billion dollars in, in valuation. And he clearly has the playbook on how to do this. And even just reading, like I'm that one, I think I'm two chapters in. Um, he talks about one, like increasing your standards. Like usually as you start delegating and hiring people, you'll let it slip and how you need to do the opposite. Every time you go to a next level, you raise the bar, similar to what Amazon does. Talks about aligning people, sharpening your focus. He talks about... If you want to have a bigger impact, you need to focus on less. Because I think, and we're guilty of this, when you start to grow, you're like, oh, I'm going to do project A and B and C. We're going to launch a podcast. We're going to launch a startup studio. He's like, don't do all those things in parallel. They will fail. Instead, have everybody focus on one thing and do them sequentially so it has the biggest impact. And that kind of knocked my, my socks off. Um, the other one was picking up the pace on like the four or five principles. And he talks about people come to him, you know, and it's like, they'll do a meeting. It's like, all right, you know, someone's assigned a project and they're like, all right, we'll have that to you in a week. And he always challenges them. He's like, okay, but what if you can get it to me tomorrow? What does it look like? And he talks about how people just don't work at the right pace. Um, and the last one is around strategy. But anyway, it's um, it's a pretty dang good book that I'm I'm devouring right now that makes me feel like I'm in the little leagues when it comes to, to running a business. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. And I usually like balance two books. Ones tend to be more, you know, business focused um, related to marketing. Another one that's more, I wouldn't say playful, but more, you know, focused on my personal life, you know, personal development or something like that. So Zag is the book that I've picked um, for the past month, um, slowly reading it. Um, it, that's it's all based on like counterintuitive things that you need to do to build a brand. Um, and actually going back to your idea of like sharpening focus, that's what Zag or like one of the recommendations in Zag is that um, as you build the brand, instead of trying to be everything for everyone, instead of having 10 features, how can you not say anything about the other features and just essentially go all in on that one feature that makes you better than everyone else in the market immediately on day one. Um, and I think the, the example he gives that everyone knows is actually Steve Jobs, when he comes back to Apple, reduces the product lines to just a few that really make sense. And they, they launched, that was the launch pad for obviously the success they have today. Um, but yeah, that's, it's a fascinating book, probably the best book I've read on marketing. Um, it's written by a practitioner, someone in the business who's done it multiple times. Um, so it's, it's a must read and something that I think I'll revisit at least like once, once a year going forward. Uh, amazing book. And the other one, um, more on personal development, is Ikigai. That's a Japanese word. Um, and the book is essentially on how the, there's secret, not a secret community, I should say a small community in Japan that has the longest living people in the world and in history. And essentially the secret to their longevity and their happy and long life is that they all focus on having a purpose in life. Um, even like they don't even have the concept of retirement. The word doesn't even exist. And Ikigai is like that intersection of when you found what you love, what you're good at, uh, what the world needs and what you can get paid for. And when you have that, it never feels like you're working. Uh, your existence and your work, your like work becomes play essentially. 
And that's Ikigai and a very interesting concept. I've been spending a lot of time thinking about that one and um, it's been an amazing read so far. Okay, I think I need that one. Um, that's so interesting that I don't have the concept of retirement. Um, so yeah. um, I don't know if the, the fat fire uh, movement resonates over there or not, but very cool. Um, <laughs> yeah. All right, so I'm trying to think where should we start? I'll, we'll start with the companies we like and then I'll do my half big startup ideas at the end. Um, all right, I'll go first. I'm going to start with, um, actually, I'll go with a simple one first. So this one I think is very impressive. So there's a company called Sparkloop. Um, they essentially allow you to, you know, grow your email list with a referral program. Um, I actually the founder of the, of, uh, the company on the podcast, but that's not why it's interesting. They just launched this product called Upscribe that will catapult your email list growth and lets you monetize your own. So the way it works is, you know, it's been kind of shown if you're morning brew, the hustle trends, um, if you want to grow your email list, you really need to pay um, and be really good at email acquisition. And so obviously social ads is one thing, but what works really well is two partnering with other email lists. So this allows you to go to their marketplace of other email lists and you can be like, I will pay $1, $2, $3 for an email subscriber. And then when someone signs up for it could be like trends. After they sign up, a simple pop-up comes up. It's like, hey, would you also like to sign up for the Startup Growth Newsletter by Growth Hit or by you know Sahil Bloom's uh, email newsletter? If they then sign up, we have to pay them like two or three bucks, but it's very much a qualified email customer that they have already vetted. And so um, he's growing like crazy with this product. We just signed up I think we're testing a spend of two grand per month to spend basically two to three dollars per email acquisition. But I think this marketplace is is going to really kind of boom for for creators. And it got me thinking, like, where else can you create a, a marketplace like this? But I'm I'm very in, interested to see how this plays out. And if you he builds in public, you can see like the the growth that's going on with this product. Yeah, and that's an interesting tool, something that I'll definitely keep an eye out on. Also, actually, just been studying uh, cross-pollinating newsletters. So there's obviously the model that you just described, but I was actually watching a video by Cody Sanchez, Jim, that I just sent to you, where at the very end, she explains how um, she creates this script that she sends to another newsletter uh, of a similar size, asking them to advertise her newsletter, and then she'll advertise... Um, so she's asking them to advertise her newsletter and they'll advertise um, her newsletter or vice versa. And they both get the benefit of each other's audience um, without any money being exchanged. So it's uh, just um, relatively manual work, but you can easily grow your newsletter without doing any of the, uh, without, you know, paying for, for, um, uh, for what you call it, for subscribers. So an interesting model that I just saw. That's super interesting. Um, oh yeah, and even with, with Upscribe, you can be on the platform where we're setting it up where people will pay us for our email list if people opt in. So could offset the charge, but um, but very cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. What what do you have? So I'll go with uh, Jay Peterman. Um, so this is an e-commerce company. Actually started as a catalog back in the late '80s that shifted to the to the internet, became you know giant e-commerce company nowadays. It's a very good example of zagging. Um, going back to the book recommendation I made earlier. So. All e-commerce sites pretty much use, you know, professional photography, um, like with the, you know, best setups and things like that to elevate the brand. What they've done is they've gone with illustrations. So the exact opposite of that. So it looks like an old, uh, the website looks like an old um, book from the late 80s, pretty much. They've stayed consistent with that brand. And they're also famous for describing all their products in literary style. So if they're trying to describe the shirt I'm wearing, for example, they'd probably reference if, if um, Jefferson if um, Thomas Jefferson was wearing this shirt back in the late 1700s, he would feel this and this and this about it. It's like they write these interesting stories that are sometimes even more interesting. And there are people who come to the site just to read those stories about pro the products without actually even buying anything, which is something I've never heard of. But they've just found their niche. They've, um, they've made that successful transition from, you know, catalog first to, um, you know, very successful internet company by sticking to their roots. And it's a fascinating brand worth checking out. That's very, yeah, I'm going to the site right now. Um, yeah, a lot of people can't land that plane going from catalog magazine to digital. Um, that's super interesting. 
Um, all right, I'll go next. This one, we'll go with the big one. So this one is Return Home. I actually, uh, we had the CEO on, um, Micah Truman, but what he's doing is insane. So the category, it's something people don't want to talk about, but it's it's the industry of death, uh, specifically terramation. So when people die, you could be buried, you could be cremated. Both are horrible for the environment. Uh, cremation, the amount of like gas and emissions that goes on in that, and then what you do with the remains is not good for the earth at all. And so what terramation is, it essentially um, turns people into soil. Um, so if someone dies, their body goes into a box, it goes in with alfalfa, some air pressure within 30 days, you become dirt that could then become a tree. And so what's interesting, um, this became legal first in Washington, now in New York. And so what they did that was really smart is they own the trademark for terramation. Um, and so anytime you have a new category or new wave that's emerging, you want to be first. So it's a land grab. And right now they are owning it. There are some other competitors in the space that have raised big money. But what's cool is these guys own the trademark and they're building the brand. They What's really interesting is how they're growing right now is through TikTok. Um, they just did a video, I think on Monday, they got 30 million views that talks about the process. Um, they're getting picked up by like all the big news outlets. And so what's happening is they're owning the category, they're building a brand, and as it gets legal in two states, it's about to go to all 50 states. I mean, I think he's about to have like a billion or trillion dollar company. Um, so that's one that I'm super like bullish on. He's actually raising around right now. And I'm like, I thought I was done angel investing, but I'm like, oh, I think I, I need to get involved in this. But um, su super interesting. Yeah, and I think there's just so much novelty with this because it's just a new concept. No one's heard of it. It's the kind of idea that will make you take, make do a double take. So, yeah, from a standing out among the the crowd, I think that they definitely have a huge advantage. That don't doesn't surprise me that their TikTok yeah. videos are getting insane views like that. But uh, yeah. interested to see what happens yeah. there. And um, he, um, and actually, one thing that's interesting, like if you, you the barrel could be like 10 15 20 grand like i think they're around like 5 grand but they do it for free if it's a kid or if it's a suicide which is actually an, an amazing pr move it's great marketing even though that wasn't their intention but it's um yeah man it's it's really impressive yeah so i'll go with a more established name that i think a lot of people in the us at least know it's uh, she shein she or shein depending on how you want to pronounce it with the you know in Chinese, it's more Shein, uh, but I think a lot of people in the West call it Shein. Um, and it's it's the largest online retailer. And there's an interesting story of how it came out of nowhere in a very short time and has taken over. Um, if you think about Zara, H&M, and a few others, like the kings of fast fashion, Shein has taken fast fashion and they've created their own segment of fashion in real time. So they have algorithms that scan the internet for the latest trends, um, all the social media platforms, and they have the ability because of obviously their their uh, you know their base in China of producing things in real time in smaller quantities and going to market faster than everyone else. So they've used that as their unique advantage to grow and you know dominate the market. Funny thing is in in China they're completely unknown. They don't sell anything in China. That's because speed and price are not an advantage in China. There are a lot of retailers that are pretty much um, can outcompete chain at, at that. But when it comes to the West. Price and speed is something that they can absolutely, you know, crush their competition, like the fast retail giants of, of the day. So it's a very interesting company. And that's like the, the inner workings uh, behind the scenes that's making all of this possible. And uh, it is now, I think, one of the largest still private unicorns in the world right now, if I'm not mistaken. You know, I, I see them in the headlines and I didn't know their secret sauce, but it's like they, they've taken what H&M did really well with turnover and responding to trends and like gone to the next level. Um, okay, that's interesting. So all I do is wear a Viore Athleisure. So I know nothing other than Viore and J. Crew. It's it's pretty sad. Um, okay. Um, I'll go with I'll go with one that isn't as sexy, but I'm kind of obsessed with it. Like um, whenever, if someone's trying to think of a startup idea, I think the worst thing you can do is be like, oh, let's think of startup ideas. Instead, frame it. I want to solve a problem that people will pay to have a solution for. And the more niche, the more 
like random, but you can own the better, especially if it's accentuated. And this one, I, I saw it and it made me so jealous. It's called mirror mate. So if <laughs> in your house, let's say you have a mirror, but the mirror doesn't have a frame. It's just exposed. The edges are exposed. If you put your finger on it, it could get cut. And so they literally just make custom frames to put around exposed mirrors. That's it. That's the business. And they do a lot of money. Um, I think it's like in, in the eight figures in, in, in revenue and they have a monopoly. They're amazing at SEO. They're amazing at ads. Um, and it's like, hey, you need a custom mirror. What's your size? They have a custom onboarding and then boom, they can get it to you. But it's one of those ideas that like you wouldn't think of unless you're like, oh man, that's annoying. I have this mirror that's been sitting there. I need to make it look nice. And, and someone turned that into a business. So it's not going to be a unicorn or anything, but it's it's like it's probably just a cash cow absolutely i love businesses like that that seem counterintuitive you can't even believe there's a business behind there but lo and behold there's most likely an eight-figure business there um, that's going to continue churning money for the foreseeable future because mirrors are never going to go out of business um yeah it's interesting <laughs> uh interesting business model the other one again actually very similar to yours jim but in a completely different space is brewmate um i heard about brewmate actually on i think my first million um and the more I looked into the company, the more I was shocked. I actually made a damn good marketing video about it as well. And their origin story is the problem was a warm alcohol. And the founder wanted to have a, um, a way to drink alcohol without it getting warm. Essentially, and a lot of the beer cans and, and other um, alcoholic drinks he was interested in were like taller cans. Um, and so he started working on a model, uh, got a little traction, and managed to scale the company into the seven figures without ever raising any money. Um, and, you know, the, uh, like the business was, was like, there was a lot of traction, a lot of people with similar problems and blew up. And I think it's well over uh, approaching a hundred million dollars actually on the approach of either acquisition or raising more money. So very fascinating brand. I think if, if someone's starting an e-commerce brand today, roommate is definitely one to, uh, to study for sure. Do you know, like what's their, positioning against yeti i mean yeti's more yeah. coolers but i feel like every SaaS company when they send me swag i get like a yeti like and my wife works at amazon like we have so many freaking yetis from like swag yeah. conference and gifts like i don't know what to do with them are, are they competing at that or is it more of like owning a specific category because i see that they do it's booze but also i think coffee actually it's pretty heavy on booze yeah, they're actually moving into the same space. But it's funny how Yeti started with coolers and moved into like, uh, you know, drinkware and things like that. Drinkware is where I think you cross over into the mass market because everyone needs drinkware. Um, and same thing with Brewmate. They started with, you know, focusing initially on alcohol, but then now it's coolers as well. They're Brewmate coolers, insulated tumblers, and many other product lines that they've uh, built out from that initial traction where they're trying to solve for warm alcohol. Nice. 500 bucks for a brewmate cooler must be nice. Um, okay, nice. I'll go next. Um, I'll do these two real quick. One is, it's called Pongo. Um, and if you know what ConvertKit is, it's, you know, an email tool for creators. Pongo is trying to do that, but for text messaging. I, I think this is something that you know, I think the younger demo is much more um, into texting and SMS. And I feel like people like don't even look at email the same way I look and use email. And so they're really trying to get a foothold in going that way. And I love that they're leading with just SMS first and their onboarding is so slick and so simple that, and I believe they have a free version so you can just get started. So I think they're going to go that MailChimp model as far as get everyone a free account, test it for free, and then try and grow that way. But I, I've been obsessed with uh, SMS and texting taking over email. There's a lot of reasons why it can be hard, um, but that's one that that I'm keeping an eye on. Um, the other one that I have is... Um, We'll go to a marketplace. This is another like niche that I didn't even know existed, but someone is like raking in the dollars from it. It's called Gather Flora. And it's essentially a, a really savvy kind of um, tech person in Silicon Valley came up with this idea for the flower industry, where she saw this problem where florists 
for weddings, for parties, for events, for, um, you know, doing their, you know, ongoing work. They have a lot of issues sourcing flowers from farms because it's very antiquated. So they created this marketplace where it connects florists with local farms so they can get basically flowers in almost like real time in under like five days. Um, but what's crazy is they launched just in San Francisco. They're already like at capacity sold out doing seven figures and they're about to be rolling out across all these other industries and markets. And it's one of those where you look around and all of a sudden you're like, wow, flowers are everywhere. Who's managing and facilitating this? And they're, they're, they're looking to own it. And so I just, I'm, I'm blown away by that one. Cause I didn't even think that was um, a, a business opportunity. Wow. That's, that's inspiring actually. Um, and then in my case, I have two companies here. Um, the both category creators. Um, one is Masterworks. So essentially, we all know that there are many different, you know, asset classes: gold, real estate, you know, equities, and things like that. And Masterworks focuses on investing in blue chip art. So it making it makes investing in art accessible for the average person. And it's it's a huge. And, and com considering that art actually outperforms the other asset classes over some given period, and it's a new, very mod. Um, like for people who are not only interested in art, but for people who are just interested in, in you know, you know, diversifying their assets, this has been um, a game changer and it's been taking over, uh, promoting a lot, uh, actually not promoting, but sponsoring a lot of podcasts lately. If you may have heard of them uh, in one of the podcasts you've listened to, but one to keep an eye on that I think is definitely going to become a unicorn, no questions asked. Dude, that's so really interesting because I mean, you see yeah. how much like Fundrise and all those other companies exactly. that want to get you to invest in real estate. It's like, hey, diversify your portfolio with with R. Like, get a percent ownership of this Banksy or Rembrandt or. Um, yeah. And that's that's all I know Absolutely. as far as uh, artists. So I'll stop there. But um, that's super. I worry though, if too many people do it, will that make the demand to like re? I don't actually. Maybe that would just help the overall value. That's that's very interesting. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it's it's interesting because actually if you look at these companies, Jim, like you like master, you were just talking about fundrise. So like fundrise was doing it for for real estate. And someone, some smart person asked, what why do we do the same thing for art? Right. Something that's that's less tangible, easy, harder to own. Um, and then with Pongo, ConvertKit uh, did it with email and they asked themselves, why do we do it with texting? So I think there are a lot of things we can ask with, you know, the companies that we like and love is like, if you, if this worked for, let's say for email, what's that, that equivalent for texting? And I think that's, that's an interesting way to brainstorm new ideas. Right. Um, it's all but, about like, don't think of anything new, just look at what works and then like turn 15 degrees and point it at a new category, a new region, or like a different use case. Absolutely. And um, the other one is Calci, actually. Um, so Calci is the first uh, federally regulated um, platform to trade the outcomes of events like stocks. Um, again, this is getting a lot of um, a lot of traction. This is more for speculators, not so much for investors. So, Jim, if you want to bet on the outcome or if, um, you know the next election or even the weather tomorrow, uh, this would be your platform for it. It's getting a lot of traction. Uh, it has an interesting backstory, but it's uh, it's a fascinating brand uh, of people who've been, um, you know, like suddenly focused on building this since, since college. So very interesting idea. Wait, I'm so am I making a bet on what will happen or what do you mean I'm making a trade? Um, so like what so asset you, is changing hands? Yeah, it's not much, actually. Um, just the um, essentially like someone has placed a bet on something happening tomorrow. And um, essentially, like a bunch of people gather to to bet on that thing happening or not, essentially. Um, but it's, it's it's more for speculators, uh, not so much for I think the serious investor. I'm sure they'll they'll find space for that. But uh, very interesting uh, platform nonetheless. Oh, very cool. They even have stuff for pop culture where you can bet on or yeah on events on like who's gonna win various categories. That's super interesting. Um, Okay, nice. Um, what else? I've, I've got two half-baked or three half-baked startup ideas I want to throw at you, but um, anything actually, else that I mean, music caught your attention? Yeah, one is actually Spark Charge. So you remember, Jim, several years ago, there was a startup that started that, that said they'll bring the fuel to you. So instead of having to line up at a gas station, someone will roll up next to your car and fuel up your car. Um, 
this is that same idea, but done for EVs. So bringing the charge to your car. Mm. So they have these mobile charging units that they bring up right up to your car, charge your car while you know, you're working. I think one oh, of the biggest frustrations so with smart. EVs is trying to find a place um, to charge your car and potentially sitting in the car or having to do something you don't want to do until the, you know, until your car is fully charged or at least charged to the point you want it to. So this is an interesting startup that I think is now at valuation of close to $100 million. Fascinating brand. That's so um, obvious. I'm so mad. There's someone in my entrepreneurship group where she, like with, with her electric car, she's in a, a condo building and it is a knife fight to get the, yeah. the parking spots that have the chargers and people, you have to like <laughs> bid on it. So there's a huge market for this. That um, dang, that's a good idea. Yeah, that's a that's a great one. And then the other one is actually something we may have covered in the past, but I wasn't sure. So I'll say it again: is Adventure Challenge. Um, it's a single product e-commerce store that's like grown over eight figures. Essentially, it's um, it's it's a series of challenges created to help um, a couple or a family bond, and just gives you those uh, those adventure challenges to to accomplish and. They've built a huge following, a very simple business without inventory and all that other nonsense that you know most e-commerce companies have to deal with. And it's uh, the margins on this business must be insane. So one to keep an eye out on, and especially if you're going into e-commerce, this is one company to study as well. Uh, this they, one's so annoying to me. Yeah. This one, like I don't, I don't know. I think it's really good branding. I'm a little jealous that they like are doing so well. I don't know if I get it, but it's like. This has been done before. They've repackaged it and just marketed it very well. So um, I'll stop being a hater. But um, yeah, you talked about this before. And I'm still angry about it. Yeah. So those are the, the companies that I've been obsessed over uh, relatively lately. All right. So are you ready for my half-baked startup ideas? Yeah, let's hear them. Okay. Um, the first one... Um, Honestly, if anybody wants to do this with us, we will build the website. We'll throw the the marketing budget and team behind it. Uh, we actually might be doing this, so maybe we'll we'll cut this out. But we see so many of our clients struggling with the migration to GA4. Essentially, all you need to know, Google Analytics is changing everything they do, and you have to migrate to their new version, which is GA4. And it's creating a lot of questions and headaches because... That is people's main source of data a lot of times. It's how their events fire that ripple through their Google ads and other things. So there's going to be a lot of money made in people that will help with that migration. I see this as a Trojan horse or as a legion for a bigger opportunity. I wanted to launch something around like Pixel Pros, where it's you know a productized service of a data team that will, hey, we'll manage your Facebook Pixel, your Google events. And I think if you use GA4 to be like the Tripwire Legion, you could then downsell like, oh, by the way, we have a monthly subscription to be your, your data team to manage everything. And you could have ongoing reporting. You could upsell based on ad platforms that need data help with. But I don't, it's a ma- I don't think it's a matter of if this idea will work. It's who's going to make it work first. And um, any, if anybody wants to start this with us, game on. Or maybe we should just do it. Um, but this is one that um, we're going to be seeing a lot more GA4 drama. Because I, I think they're making the switch. Is it September? It's coming up pretty yeah. soon. Yeah, September. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but this is, this is a no-brainer, I think. You don't even have to figure out what that final offer will be. I think even just getting people in the door uh, with this Trojan horse is worth building. And uh, Jim, I think, I know we're trying to focus on sharpen, you know that, but uh, (laughs) this is one that I think even just having an MVP landing page and putting out there, um, this is a no brainer. Everyone needs this. Like you can't afford to not have GA4 on your site anymore. So yeah, yeah, the the, yeah. the problem is it's going to get real messy. We have a very talented developer that's helping helping this with a couple clients, and every client is different. Everything is custom, and it gets real muddy. And he's really excited about this, but he's like, "If you want to do this, he's like, I need so much more help than just me." And so I'm like, "Okay, all right, we need to to ramp up." So anyway, there, there's one half baked idea. Uh, we'll actually go in this similar vein. 
um, with Google, Google um, is killing Google Optimize as it moves to GA4. And for people that don't know, Google Optimize is a testing tool where you can do A-B testing of your homepage, do one variation, do another variation. And a lot of people use it because it's free. You can do up to five experiments at once. We use it a lot with our clients. And if you don't want to use it and you want to use a paid version, all of a sudden you're using Convert or something, VWO. And those are like, 800, a thousand bucks a month. That's a big jump from free. So I think there's a huge opportunity to kind of do the MailChimp model where how can you come up with a free AB testing tool based on usage where, hey, you get one or two free experiments per month, but then it could ramp up to paid. Um, and it's all about taking the market share that's going to be exposed once Google kills Google Optimize. I obviously convert and all the existing A-B tools are gunning for it, but a lot of them have gone upstream. Um, I'm thinking more of a do-it-yourself self-serve A-B testing model. Uh, but what, what do you think about that? Yeah, this is an interesting one. I think it needs a lot more digging. I don't think it's... it's um... Like what's going to happen next is as obvious as we think it is. Um, I think there's definitely going to be a scramble for um, essentially where do all those customers go? Um, obviously, some of them will you know stay within the GA4 setup, assuming that Google continues to have a testing tool built in there. But um, yeah, optimize VWO convert. Many others are going to you know start circling for sure. So and they're very well financed, so it won't be without competition. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, the other thing to call out, there's this website called Killed by Google. So like Google and Amazon, they launch a lot of projects, but their goal of success is very different from ours, where if it doesn't make a billion dollars, they'll kill the business line. And so at Killed by Google, it shows all the projects that they launched and then sunsetted. But what that means is they didn't sunset them because they didn't have zero customers. They probably didn't have millions of customers. So within each of those things that were sunsetted, there is a seven-figure, eight-figure, or even nine-figure business opportunity, right? Because top of the list on the website is Google Optimize. Like Google Trends was killed. YouTube Originals was killed. Um, Google My Business, the app was killed. Um you know, there, there's a lot of things here where I think there's some some good business opportunities um, in that. Well, but, um, I'm actually just on the site now, Jim, and I'm finding a lot of com uh, like products that I used to use in the past. I didn't know they were dead. Uh, they, have, <laughs> they have a tombstone <laughs> on the page. Like, yeah. wow, um, this is quite interesting. But you're right, there's definitely a lot of opportunity here. Um, but keep in mind as well, some of these are built on current Google assets like YouTube and things like that. So yeah, at least there's at least one in here that's that's worth pursuing for sure. Yeah, a little, little bit of an unfair advantage when you can roll it out and get like a million impressions within an hour. Um, okay, the, the final idea that I have, this one is near and dear to my heart. Um, it's the no fee financial advisors. Um, I like you and I are both big fans of Ramit Sethi. I will teach you to be rich. Um, I know you're going uh, down the, the the fire movement, which we need to do a whole podcast on financial independent retire early. Um, whenever you use a wealth manager, um, they charge a percentage of your assets, and you might hear like a one percent. You know, it, it sounds small, but when you do the math. Holy smokes, it adds up. And if you try and look at the hourly rate of the work they do versus what they get, the ROI is insane. And I don't know if that makes sense, to be honest. Um, when you're meeting with somebody three to four times a year, um, does it really get that value? Um, and it's something that, you know, it's even in that book from Meet Study talks about like, don't try and like save on. $10 for lattes or for Netflix subscriptions. It's not about dollars. It's about percentages. That's where the big savings come from. And I think a lot of people are getting more and more financially literate where they don't need this antiquated system. What they would want is, could I meet four times a year with a really smart CFA or financial advisor to give me advice? And yes, that should be really expensive. Maybe it's like 200, 500 bucks an hour. But you're paying like a grand to five grand per year 
significantly less as your assets over under management get up to be even higher. So this is one where it'd be like an hourly uh, financial advisor fee that would kind of try and disrupt the market. Because I think a lot of people get angry with having to pay percentages, especially if their financial advisor is literally just doing like, oh, here's your risk profile. And they, they set it and forget it. But that's one. Um, there, if there's any CFAs that want to do this, um, I'm all about it. The no fee financial advisor. That's that's actually the name of the brand, I think, uh, is the no fee financial advisors. <laughs> yeah. I think it's it's right there staring us in the face. And uh, this has a lot of legs. But have you done like market research, Jim? I'm curious. Um, are there? Yeah, any... I spoke to myself and three friends and they all love it. But um, that's four people. <laughs> Surely, like there must be. Oh, does it exist? Things. Yeah, I yeah, actually did exist. Google it. It does exist, but it's legion for people to get you to be doing the percentage based stuff. Uh, Encore, the founder of Teachable, um, is doing something kind of in this vein that I think is really cool. I need to get the name of it, but I I want to um, do something that where like this is the main motive of it. This is this is definitely worth pursuing, Jim. I think this has a lot of legs. Uh, and I think it's called Ocho. I'm just yes. checking it out right now. Yeah. Yeah, he's definitely onto something, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. and yeah, fascinating brand nonetheless. Nice. Um, well, cool. Well, our, our, our time is up. We have other responsibilities to jump to. But hey, I think we did good. I think we threw out like 15 or 20 ideas that might get people's attention. But um, we'll, we'll see how if people like this and then we'll maybe do it again. Yeah, this is exciting, actually. This was very good, Jim. I enjoyed it. Uh, let's do it again. Awesome. See you, bud. Thanks.